Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hoki koa ho, tahe moriora. Inga mana, inga reo, ro rakatira ma, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto. Norera, ko waio, ko harleen hain, tako ingawa, ko te tumuaki o te fariwanaka o otago aho. Namihi nui a kie koto, norera, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanatato katoa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Harlene Hain, and I have the great privilege of being the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And it gives me great pleasure to provide some opening remarks at this inaugural professorial lecture for Professor Haxby Abbott. Now, these lectures are a time of celebration for us here at the University of Otago, and I'm so happy to see so many people here to share in Haxby's success. As I look out on the audience tonight, I see academic and professional staff from throughout the university. I see members from our northern campus in Wellington and um, representatives from the university and council, including our chancellor. I also see members of the wider Dunedin community. And I would like to warmly welcome all of you to this amazing event. But on behalf of the university, I would like to also extend a particularly warm welcome to members of Haxby's family who are here to support him this evening. His wife, Sarah, is here, his son, George, his daughter, Faith, his mother, June, his sister, Wendy, his niece, Ruby, and his uncle, Murray, are all here in the audience. How lucky Haxby is to have so many members of his immediate and extended fauna with him um, to support him on this very important occasion. To all of you, nomai, haramai, welcome. Now we take promotion to professor extraordinarily seriously here at the University of Otago, and as part of our evaluation process, we seek the views of independent international experts in the applicant's area of research. Now, when we sought views um, about Haxby, and he hasn't seen these because these are confidential recommendations, um, we learned things like, Dr. Abbott's protective publication record represents high quality research that has significantly contributed to the advancement of non-surgical management of musculoskeletal disorders and outcome assessment in clinical practice. His work has made a substantial impact on instructors and practitioners of orthopedic physical therapy. We also learned that Dr. Abbott has established himself as a leading clinical researcher in musculoskeletal health research, both nationally and internationally. He's earned the respect of his peers in the physical therapy profession and has been extremely successful in the advancement of knowledge and has shown outstanding leadership in research. So Haxby, on behalf of the University of Otago, it gives me very great pleasure to congratulate you on your well-earned promotion to professor. I will now hand over to the Dean of the Dunedin School of Medicine, Professor Barry Taylor, to tell us just a bit more about Haxby's academic journey to professor. Norera, tanakoto, tanakoto, tanatato, katoa. Kia ora, everybody. It's a great pleasure to introduce Haxby, who's, uh, and, and actually to plot uh, the sort of trajectory of his academic life, uh, which is my role, in less than five minutes. Um, the, um, like our previous IPL from our school, Sarah Young, who gave her IPL two weeks ago, um, Haxby was born in a very small town um, called Lowcliffe, which was next to the Rangitata River, just uh, south of Christchurch. He went to a rural school uh, and uh, then on to Waitaki Boys High and then finally came to Otago after that. So, um, so we've, this is the second person in a row who's actually had his initial uh, sort of education in actually a very small school. He came to Otago uh, thinking that he might want to do marine biology, but ended up doing a, um, a, a, a physiotherapy degree uh, and then uh, doing some locum roles around New Zealand, uh, I see uh, really across New Zealand, uh, in a, as a physiotherapist before going to the States. Uh, while in the States, uh, he um, got, I think, turned on to academia and um, sidetracked into research. 
he uh, proceeded to do a, a Master of Science in Physical Therapy, uh, and then came back to Otago to do his PhD. Um, and uh, so in 2005, he graduated with his PhD at Otago, uh, and then uh, worked in the School of Physiotherapy as a research fellow and then a senior research fellow before transferring to the Dunedin School of Medicine, uh, where I've known him really since uh, the, um, about 2010. He started in the Department of Orthopaedics, uh, and it's uh, good to see the orthopaedics uh, people here, um, and fairly rapidly moved from senior research fellow uh, to three years later, a research associate professor, 2013, uh, finally making professor last year. He's currently the director of the Center for Musculoskeletal Research uh, within the orthopedic department, and uh, as noted by Harleen, um, has been, I think, instrumental in actually showing that a surgical solution is not all you need, uh, especially if you've got osteoarthritis, and that there's a range of other things that we'll hear about shortly. Um, on the academic side, he has raised more than 10.5 million in research grants, uh, of which 7.8 million were related, uh, where, where he is actually the, the prime investigator or co-prime investigator. He supervised eight PhDs, seven master's uh, students, and uh, has had several other awards and honors, the Carl Smith Research Medal in particular, uh, for early career researcher, and also the Sir Charles Herkes uh, Research Fellowship from the Health, Health Research Council. He has greater than 94 peer-reviewed publications, uh, and is the editor, including editor-in-chief of four different journals in his area of expertise. So uh, you can see the trajectory, not actually the traditional trajectory that you might expect. So I expect we're going to learn quite a lot about what is this unique individual who's able to actually almost uh, not fit the early trajectory that we would often see in academics who come from academic families. So here's a really interesting story coming to us. Thank you. Katangi te titi, katangi te kaka, katangi hokiaho. Tanakoto, tanakoto, tanakoto katoa. Uh, thank you for the generous introductions uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you all here tonight. Thank you to friends and family, members of the public, colleagues, old friends, and uh, current students and, and the community. Thank you for, uh, for coming along and sharing this uh, event with me. What I'd like to share with you today is um, not just some highlights of the research that I've been working on, but a little bit about what drives me, maybe a little bit about how I uh, uh, ended up uh, doing what I'm doing, um, and what it means to me, and what next. So, but first, we are asked when giving these inaugural professorial lectures to, to give a little bit of our academic journey, our, our research journey. Um, this is a, a billboard from the campus of the Vrij University Amsterdam, where I had the privilege of doing a, a short um, sabbatical. They have quite a few of these dotted about the campus, all with wise or inspirational quotes about um, people's reflections on their, their, their academic journey, the pathways to wisdom and knowledge. And it's important to acknowledge that one never gets to, to this place without uh, a lot of help from uh, a lot of goodwill and a lot of good people um, over a long period of time. And so uh, all of you who appear on the slide, I thank you very much, and I really uh, appreciate um, all of your help and um, support over the years. And I've also had not just the privilege, but the great benefit of working beside a lot of great people, a lot of really lovely people who have um, uh, worked uh, alongside, and, um, and still some more that I've missed, and I apologize to any that I've missed, and I thank you all uh, very much. This is the wonderful group of young people that I work with at the moment. Um, 
They are bright and humble and hardworking and really a joy to work with, and you'll see some of their work in this evening's lecture. As a research-only academic, I am profoundly grateful to the research funders who have supported my research, who have assessed and then backed some of my ideas and proposals and advanced training, and without this funding, I would not be here at all today. And I'm grateful to some inspirational teachers along the way, a few of whom I'll mention tonight, uh, and there have been many more, and also to inspirational colleagues. Um, perhaps there's a few here in the audience tonight who have, um, have come on this journey with me. But I'd also like to thank this university for giving me the freedom to pursue my own research directions, to pursue my own footsteps. And firstly, as a PhD student, then at the School of Physiotherapy, uh, as an early career academic, and more recently, in the past nine years or so, at the Dunedin School of Medicine. Uh, it's a great university to work in, a beautiful campus, uh, and a wonderful, wonderful part of the world. And most importantly, uh, I'd like to thank my family for all of the love and joy you've brought um, and the support you've given through uh, the, the tough times and the disappointments and uh, the, the, the pride and joy that you've shared with me through the, the, the triumphs, um, especially my wonderful, beautiful wife, Sarah, for keeping me grounded and reminding me to... Um, uh, realize what are the important things of all that is important of life and to keep a balance in all of those important things and to make sure I smell the roses and enjoy the journey along the way. Thank you. Um, so, to my research journey. Uh, I didn't set out to be a clinical epidemiologist or any kind of health researcher or, or any kind of health professional, really. As Barry said, I, I, um, I started out, uh, I was brought up on a, a mixed cropping and sheep farm in rural mid-Canterbury. I enjoyed the farm. I enjoyed the animals and operating machinery and the outside, the fresh air, and I was very fortunate that my father did not impose expectations on me that that I was you know, to be a farmer and take over the farm, and I had freedom to, to find my own pathway. And I was uh, captivated as a youth by the underwater world of Jacques Cousteau. And so by the end of high school, I had my scuba diving ticket, and I was off to the University of Otago to study marine biology. Until two separate careers advisors said, no, 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 that's not a good idea. There are far too many marine biologists and not enough jobs. Um, so I arrived at university a little bit, um, with a little bit of indecision, a little bit um, uh, directionless, and ended up enrolling in an eclectic mix of arts and science papers, which, which was a wonderful experience, and I'm glad that I did. Uh, and it was perhaps a wonderful expression of my newfound freedom coming from um, uh, a relatively conservative uh, boys' boarding school, farming background, to be in um, like the academic sweet shop of, of a university and being able to sample all that uh, was available here to see and learn and experience. To this day, the most inspiring teachers I think of were from that first year. And I think of um, Charles Hyam and Helen Leach from Anthropology 101, 102, and somebody, possibly Jeff White, from uh, Psychology 111 and 112, um, and, but 1986 and 1987 were perhaps more than uh, academically expansive, they were socially expansive. And at, at Simon College, so now Simon Hall, uh, then Simon Hall, um, I met some physiotherapy students. They were fun and quite lovely. Um, I'd never heard of physiotherapy before, um, but I kind of liked the sound of what they were doing. You know, it was... It was helping people constructively. It was sort of physical, and it was sort of mechanical, but with human levers and hinges and bellows and wiring. And, um, and so I, I decided to apply. And on my second attempt, 
uh, I got in. In the meantime, I did a second year at university in uh, physical education in order to do the anatomy and physiology papers. So I was at a first year student at um, Otago Polytechnic, third year tertiary student, that I discovered that I, that I liked teaching and, uh, and that I enjoyed teaching. And I'd covered the anatomy and physiology material the year before, and some of my classmates in my tutorial groups were you know, feeling a, bit, a little uh, overwhelmed, and um, I enjoyed helping them learn and helping them to make it seem logical. And as it turned out, that was one of the most formative experiences of my career. But by the time I got to my fourth year as a tertiary student, second year in, in Otago Polytechnic's uh, physiotherapy, had gone from the, the stricture of boarding school to the freedom of university, I, I was feeling frustrated by the relatively more insular, apprentice-like environment that I felt that I was in. And I was restless, constrained, rebellious. <laughs> I failed that year. <laughs> So I did what any self-respecting Otago Scarfie would do. I took a gap year, joined up with some friends, wore women's underpants on the outside of my... Uh, and took a road trip. I returned, completed the course, graduated, practiced for a few months in Dunedin Hospital, Ashburton Hospital, before setting off for America. There I got wide experience, traveled, and felt competent and, and felt well-trained, and perhaps more so than I'd given Otago Polytechnic credit for, and, and was grateful. Uh, I pursued a master's degree there, began te a teaching internship at the, at the University of St. Augustine, and I enjoyed the teaching. I was passionate about being good at it. I wasn't at first. I was terrible, uh, self-conscious, nervous. I have an old video of, of uh, one of my first lectures. I've saved you the pain of watching it. Um, but I became good at it. Uh, I was diligent, had high standards, was perhaps a bit too earnest, but I wasn't yet 30. Um, and it was in the process of doing that master's degree in order to be qualified to teach that I discovered research. And I found that as, as much as I was enjoying teaching, I, I, was, I was really digging this research. So. My wife and I returned to New Zealand uh, to be recycled students at Otago. Um, Sarah for a second career in medicine and me to take on the new challenge of a PhD. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do the PhD in the Department of Anatomy and Structural Biology, um, where I got such a valuable grounding in good quality science, biological science. And it was during these years that I encountered some other great teachers, because I. I've always felt that um, a person should get a good grounding in the area that they're, they're on, really sort of foundational stuff. And so I felt, well, you know, if I'm going to get a doctorate in philosophy, then I probably should know a little bit about philosophy. So um, I enrolled in philosophy 101 or 102, uh, epistemology it was, and there I encountered um, uh, Alan Musgrave and all his... Uh, wisdom and gravitas, uh, and I also pursued some courses in epidemiology and biostatistics, even though coursework is not really encouraged at the University of Otago or a New Zealand PhD, um, but I'm so glad I did. It was really valuable, and it's really set the foundation for uh, my research career um, and, and uh, training to be uh, a clinical epidemiologist and working with, with numbers and data and, and um, the basis of, of new knowledge. So, how do we know things? Well, there are many ways to approach this. Talk to Professor McLaurin after the class. Um, but I was particularly interested in the philosophy of scientific experimentation, of cause and effect of interventions and outcomes in healthcare interventions. Now, in order to tell whether a treatment has been effective um, in, a, uh, in a, a patient, we could either do something like take a, a sample of that population, let's say people with osteoarthritis, and provide a treatment, and then over the course of time, we can measure the effects of that treatment, 
And we might think that we're seeing the effects of the treatment, but, but really we're, we're, we're not, because it could just be the passage of time. You know, maybe the people are going to get better anyway. Maybe they would have been better without the treatment. And so, well, what about comparing two treatments? We could compare two treatments and over their, check their effects over the passage of the same amount of time. Um, but still, that wouldn't give us a solid foundation of knowing whether the difference is really from the two different treatments. Or perhaps the people that ended up in one treatment were the fitter, younger, less severe patients, and you know, the older, more severe ones with comorbidities and, and crumbly joints were in the other treatment, and they weren't the same. They weren't balanced. And then we wouldn't really, uh, that would bias the results. So here is where we uh, introduce the magic of randomization. And the intention of randomization is to ensure that the people that uh, are randomly allocated to each of the two groups are equivalent in all manner of factors that might influence their outcome, like, for example, their age, their height, their weight, their sex, their severity of their disease, how long they've had the disease, what other diseases they have, etc. And so that way, when we look at the difference in effects, we can be much more sure that the difference really is to the only thing that should be different between those two groups, and that is the treatment they've got. So we can also apply this to economic evaluations. And in this case, we not only uh, assess the effects over time, but we look at the costs as well as the effects over time. And the outcome is the, the difference in costs divided by the difference in effects. And I've, I've had the, the opportunity to conduct um, a number of physical uh, of um, randomized controlled trials over um, my career and to do with um, plantar heel pain and elbow pain and back pain and several in osteoarthritis, um, including this one. Which, in which we showed that um, the people who received the three physiotherapy intervention programs that we provided got a better outcome than those who had the usual care alone. And those outcomes seemed to be still improving at two years follow-up, even though all of the treatment was only provided in the first year. Now, because I, I don't want to, to bore those of you in the audience who have seen um, several of the other trials and their outcomes, et cetera, before, uh, I'll skip to the new stuff. And uh, this, because I'm always excited about the future. And so this is a graph of the quality of life that people experience over a period of time where higher number is higher quality of life. So as we can see, this here um, is the usual care group. This is the, uh, the usual way, the old way. And what we can see is people um, stayed much the same in the first year, got a little better hardly at all the first year, a little worse at the second year. They, improved a, 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 they seem to improve slightly over the five years of follow-up, but probably that is... Um, interventions that they receive subsequent to the trial, for example, joint replacement surgery. And this is uh, the most effective intervention from our trial, the exercise therapy. And we can see that um, the difference here is the difference in health-related quality of life. So we can conclude that we made a difference. Well, I'm very proud of the fact that we made a difference for the 150 or so people in the trial that received the interventions, particularly the 50 or so that received uh, this most effective one. But if that's where it stops, then that would be a bit limited, wouldn't it? You know, it, it, it wouldn't be a great impact if that was all that it touched, if those people were all that it touched. So this isn't what drives me. What drives me is the fact that we could get this difference in a lot of people if we were able 
to get these people, to get the treatment delivered to all of those who needed it and who wished to receive it. So I really wanted to get these research findings implemented. Uh, and I tried this in several ways. The most conventional is to, to write about it, to go to conferences, to talk about it. And that can make a little bit of a, a change, as we'll see shortly. Secondly, I tried to get a bigger trial, an implementation trial in primary care, where we um, set up a specialized clinic for patients with osteoarthritis, delivered the interventions, and were able to show what the costs and effects were in a real um, primary care environment. And thirdly, I pitched the idea to the, the hospital um, for what we called the joint clinic, which aims to serve the unmet need of patients referred with uh, end-stage hip and knee osteoarthritis, but were not severe enough to be offered surgery. With the Southern DHB, we got some funding from the National Health Board uh, to set that up, and it's now provided consultation and treatment to around 700 people. As a researcher, what I would really like to see, what the funders of research want to see, what all stakeholders in research want to see, is impact for the research to, to change things. Now, I mentioned earlier that I, I tried to get a bigger trial funded, an implementation trial. Uh, and I tried over four years to get that trial funded. And I got what I thought were good reviews, but it never quite made the cut. You know, I failed to get that uh, off the ground. So I thought to myself, well, if they won't fund me to do a real trial, what if I pitch the idea of doing a simulated trial. So computer simulation modeling is, uh, is a way of lifting the curtain on an alternate reality. What would be the costs and the effects or the outcomes if we were to have chosen a different path, if we were to do something differently? And um, I like to think of it as uh, and computer simulation modeling is used in things like weather prediction and predicting what would be the outcomes of overfishing or of climate change. And it's always based on real data, observed data, the highest quality observed data that one can find. And I like to think of it as uh, kind of like a, a trial, a virtual trial standing on the shoulders of many existing real trials. All of those standing on the shoulders of our knowledge about the course of disease, its symptoms, the costs and effects, all standing on the shoulders of detailed knowledge of the target population and the underlying population from, from which they come. Here's how it works. First of all, we start with as accurate as possible description of our underlying population, a description of the age, sex, ethnicity, um, of the uh, base population, uh, what proportion have the disease, um, the distribution of BMI among those with the disease and those without the disease, and they enter the simulation model. The simulation model has annual transitions of health states that are uh, model the disease progress of osteoarthritis for those who have osteoarthritis, or simply follow the observed base uh, underlying costs and effects that are accrued over a person's lifetime through background health care, background health losses, onset of diseases according to their risk of disease, um, probability of uh, degrees, uh, deg uh, disease onset, probability of disease progression, and we can overlay the effects of treatment. And then, over the patient's, the simulated patient's lifetime, we add up the accumulated costs and effects on quality of life over each year of modeled life until death or until they turn 100, which becomes first, and then we start with a new simulated patient. And these simulated patients are randomly drawn from the underlying population. Now, we can do one of these virtual trials uh, with about a million people in each group overnight. And then when we come back to work in the morning, the results are in the inbox. Thank you, Ross. 
And um, whereas the MOA trial, we, it took us a year to recruit 200 people and a year to deliver the interventions, and a year to follow them up at one year, and then so on until five years. It took about five years to get the data on 200 people. Sorry, I've got to hit myself. Um, <clears throat> so what we can use this for is to look at what would be the effects at the population level if we were to do things differently. And Based on what has been observed before in real trials of real people with real comparisons in the real world. In other words, to answer the question, what if we were to do things differently? So let's start with just that first trial, the MOA trial, which had 206 people. If we look at just the observed data on those 206 people, of both their health effects and their costs, not just the cost of providing the intervention, but all healthcare costs, and not just all healthcare, not just all healthcare costs, but also social costs like their um, loss of uh, productivity and loss of income and um, uh, costs, um, out-of-pocket expenses uh, uh, for the disease and transport to health uh, events, etc. And what we saw, what could we see in these observed data is this, cost savings. Yes, it does cost money to deliver the intervention, but what we found was that it more than recouped the costs of providing the intervention through savings in other areas of the healthcare system. We saw almost a third of a, of a healthy year gained per person, and calculate $3 million of net monetary benefit assuming the value of a healthy life being at the conventional uh, rate of uh, one times GDP per capita per year, which is a, the conventional um, metric. So, I mean, this looks pretty good, really, doesn't it? Um, about uh, a $3.50 value for each dollar invested, because the trial itself cost about 850000 But... Oh, hang on, that's just these people over just five years. Yet we saw that the effects over five years, the lines were pretty parallel. They weren't getting uh, closer together anytime soon. And the same thing has been observed in a similar trial in the UK. So what if we were to model the ongoing costs and effects over the lifetime of these MOA trial participants right through their expected lifespan under the assumptions of the intervention lasting five years, the intervention lasting, uh, degrading over time, intervention lasting throughout their lifetime uh, at the same uh, uh, difference to usual care. Well, but hang on. Hasn't the MOA trial had further impact than that? Haven't we, we've, we've delivered these interventions to other people. Well, yes, we did the demo trial here in Dunedin, another 75 people. Um, we did a, a, a parallel trial in the United States of 300 people using exactly the same protocols. Um, the Melbourne HIP trial used our HIP protocols from the MOA trial. Dunedin Hospital used the intervention protocols in their outpatients. Uh, it formed the basis of the, the interventions provided for the joint clinic. And some other programs who um, were applying to a, a Ministry of Health uh, pilot program called the Mobility Action Plan, um, they approached us and asked for our protocols as the basis of what they would deliver for that program. So with my colleague, uh, Dr. Ross Wilson, we thought we'd do a bit of an exercise in adding up what would be the costs and effects of the direct impact of the MOA trial. Well, first of all, we didn't count the ones that we did overseas. And we didn't count the Dunedin Hospital outpatients because we couldn't get the numbers out of the system. Um, we only counted 340 or so of the joint clinic ones whom we had followed up for two years. Um, but there have been more that ha uh, haven't got through to follow up yet. So that's about uh, 2,300. And we estimated the, the costs and effects over the time to date, as well as what they would be over 
uh, the longer term. And so here's what we find. We find that the MOA trial itself, here in the blue, provides these costs and effects. And then those on top of that is the demo trial, and then on top of that is the joint clinic, and then on top of that is the mobility action program uh, providers that have used our protocols. And what we see from this is that um, where the real impact comes is through implementation. If we were able to get uptake, if we were able to communicate the value of what we're doing and get implementation, that's where we get the gains. And so what would those gains look like? Well, now we're talking about 1,500 uh, years of healthy life gained and about 140 million uh, of, of net monetary benefit um, can be traced back uh, under those assumptions to the start of that, of that series of work. And so, you know, that's better. That's like $165 return for each dollar invested in the trial. And what this shows that is that if we can get the results of research into practice, if we can implement them, if we can deliver them, we can show some pretty appreciable impact to, to people, to the community, to the healthcare system, and to society. If, ah, if only, if only we can get it delivered. And our healthcare system at the moment is not delivering, to any great extent, those things that are the most effective and most cost effective and the most highly recommended by all of the international clinical practice guidelines and international experts, and that is the two most highly recommended things are um, supervised exercise therapy and weight loss programs for those um, who, uh, for whom it's appropriate. So why aren't we doing that? Well, there are a number of barriers, really, to, the, to delivering evidence-based care. We've got, um, at multiple levels, what consumers prefer, uh, what patients value, what providers offer, what experts recommend, what healthcare systems are willing to pay for, and what is, can be delivered within the healthcare structure. Hmm. So... What, a, what if we asked these stakeholders uh, what they value and prefer in terms of delivering and receiving care? And so, yes, we did this. And this is work by um, uh, uh, PhD student Jason Chua. We, we recruited um, people from these, this stakeholder group and over a process of research, this is what we found, that these are the things that they value and prefer the most in order of preference, with the preference waiting for each attribute of an intervention. So what if we apply this to the evidence about um, how strongly each intervention scores on these attributes? And so we've done this. And put it all together and a very nice interactive uh, web table developed by uh, Dr. Ross Wilson. Um, and what this shows is that here for early osteoarthritis, we see a, a kind of a mismatch between what people value and prefer and what is effective and, and what really gets delivered in the healthcare system. And it goes both ways because weight loss is really not featuring here and what people prefer and value, but it is one of the most highly recommended and most effective interventions. So there's a mismatch between uh, what we need to deliver and what we are delivering. Uh, and here, what we can, uh, and this is an order of, um, of, of priority, and what we see is actually um, the exercise therapies are four out of the top five, and for early intervention, and for late intervention, late uh, stage osteoarthritis, um, joint replacement surgery, 
Um, probably should be number one, uh, really. I'm a bit suspicious about the underlying data from, from the very few uh, trials about Tai Chi. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, it's an effective intervention uh, as an exercise-based intervention. But the preferences are very, very similar for those two interventions. But we focus so much on one uh, and not so much on the other. And the, the beauty of the methods that we've gone about doing this and the, the way that we're conveying them is that these tables and these data can be updated they, um, as new evidence comes to light and as new interventions become available. And new interventions you know, will become available. Uh, I get mail from time to time from... From, uh, from patients um, and members of the public suggesting I, I do research on a, a treatment they're enthusiastic about. I've got one of those letters here, actually. Um, and this is from a lady uh, in North Otago who, who recommends a, a treatment that's, that's not on one of our, our tables, doesn't currently feature on our tables of evidence, um, but she claims it's highly effective... Uh, she says that uh, I'd like to tell you about something I've discovered that takes all my pain away, she says. I am 65 years old. I couldn't knit for 10 years with this damn arthritis. Please try this yourself. You'll be amazed with the results. Cannabis butter. <laughs> she doesn't smoke it. She tried smoking it and it made it worse. Um, but so she, uh, she bakes it into muffins, and she has a muffin for more breakfast and one for morning tea. She says, I will continue to do this, even though I understand cannabis is illegal. And I, um, she says, uh, um, I, all I need is five plants, and I, I grow them behind my chook house. <laughs> I won't include my name and address, because I may get in trouble for this. Uh, but I feel some research must be done on this miracle plant. So as we get more evidence about more treatments, we can assess them on the same yardsticks as the existing evidence and include them on the same league table um, that we have uh, populated with the evidence from the Royal Australian uh, General Practitioner's Clinical Guidelines. And if we were to deliver the two most effective, most recommended interventions that feature on not just the most recent guidelines, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners one, but all of the International Osteoarthritis Research Society ones, US, UK, and those are, again, supervised exercise therapy and weight loss uh, where indicated, then this would be the projected healthcare uh, uh, quality of life gains. Now, it looks like you know, a reasonably slim line. But at the population level, it's actually a very large amount because osteoarthritis is so common. And it affects people over such a long period of time. And the difference amounts to 350,000 years of healthy life. And the net monetary benefit of delivering those interventions in terms of the healthy life years gained, valued at one times GDP per capita per year, minus the healthcare costs of delivering those interventions, is around um, 10.9 billion. So that got us to thinking, what if we could better estimate what were the healthcare gains and, and costs? Because our model and these um, estimates don't really capture all of the health uh, care savings or of um, the health uh, gains in, 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 in good detail. And so we have um, looked at what if we could estimate the uh, first-line intervention for people with hip or knee osteoarthritis, that's supervised exercise therapy, 
using data f generated here in New Zealand uh, from a high quality randomized controlled trial that compared the intervention with usual care and we overlay that with all of the underlying healthcare costs uh, of the population uh, within the New Zealand healthcare system and then uh, modelled the outcomes over time. And, and this is what we'd find, um, a net lifetime benefit of close to 20 billion of the 2013 adult population of around about 2.7 million. And of those, around about 640,000 would sometime over their lifetime become eligible for the intervention, and about two-thirds would accept it and take it up. Those are the uh, assumptions of this analysis. And that would result, based on the cost savings we observed in the five-year trial uh, right here in Dunedin, lifetime cost savings to the healthcare system. And yes, it costs money to provide the interventions, but again, those uh, costs are more than recouped through savings in other areas of the healthcare system. So, what will it take for us to do this? To do it differently? To deliver these, these potential benefits? Well, I think we need to restructure the healthcare system just a little bit so that the interventions that are most uh, recommended by the International Clinical Practice Guidelines with the best evidence and those that people delivering and receiving the interventions value and prefer, if we restructure so that those can be made available within the healthcare system, then, um, and then we need to ensure they are delivered well. The, um, so my aim is to communicate the impact to policy makers, and we're going to do this through a, um, we're writing up a, 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 a briefing document for the ministry at the moment um, based on the findings of our, of our modeling research and the basis of the clinical trial research earlier and some of the observations from um, other uh, trials around the world. And then, here's my plan. I'd like to roll out nationwide some training for providers on um, how to deliver what people value and prefer and what works best in a way that is, it is most effective. And then I plan to reach out to the community and to raise health literacy about osteoarthritis, to communicate our findings and our recommendations, not just to um, the policymakers, but also to uh, to people suffering from osteoarthritis in easy to access language, language that people can understand, um, to connect with people who are unable to access the health care that they need, providers that are unable to get people the health care that they would prefer and value. And to do this, I'm going to go on another road trip. Um, the Tour Aotearoa is a 3,000-kilometer bicycle adventure from Cape Reinga to the Bluff. And in mid-February to mid-March next year, uh, they hold the biennial Tour Aotearoa Brevet, which is a, um, uh, uh, an event where all of the riders have to, as individuals, ride the whole course um, unsupported, um, continuously within a time frame of between 10 and 30 days. I intend to take 30 days. <laughs> and along the way, I'm going to, I plan to um, hold uh, five or six um, public lectures uh, in town halls, in towns up and down the length of our beautiful country, um, to, to reach out to the community uh, uh, about... Um, about health care and about uh, how to um, improve their, the symptoms and effects of osteoarthritis. Um, and I intend to use uh, this 
event to help to raise some funds to um, fund some of the impact activities to try to get implementation from the research that we've already done. Um, because, you know, that's what we all want. We want to see a change being made and, um, and to further impact implementation and outreach. So I hope you'll uh, support me in that effort. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention tonight. Um, I've focused a lot on the future, but in a grounding of what uh, research we have done in the past. And um, because I'm, I'm always excited about the future, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to spending it here at the university. Thank you. Is green is on, sorry. <laughs> your flexibility and your change in those early years has carried through in the attributes you've demonstrated in your research. And two things sort of strike me. One is obviously impact that you've demonstrated, that it's about making modest differences and a common condition to a large number of people. And some of you sitting in the audience, getting to my age and up, have probably already got some creaky joints, and a lot of you are going to get them in the future. So this will be important to too many of us. And you've demonstrated, obviously, the economic benefits to the country as well as the quality of life benefits. And I think another important attribute that's come out that is something I admire in you is resilience. And it takes resilience to be successful in getting external grant funding, and Haxby's been very good at that. And as a head of department, that makes you smile because external grant funding comes with overheads and that makes the coffers uh, good and it gives the department a bit of flexibility and also Haxby in, in, in his research. So he's been successful in that area and also starting in physiotherapy and then through anatomy and then into surgery. It is difficult to negotiate um, people that think and come from different paradigms and he's done that as he's moved through his career and he works with surgeons who... Um, I guess we're, we're very easy people, I think, to get along with. And um, <laughs> I guess, you know, the, there's always the big bang of the hip replacement to get rid of your arthritis and make it much better, but that comes with pain and cost, and um, not everybody wants that and not everyone needs it. And so Haxby has put himself in a position where he's juxtaposed to a completely different sort of, you know, cut-to-cure mentality versus uh, physical therapy, and yet done that successfully and, and flourished. And so thank you very much for being in our department, for delivering your lecturer and being an outstanding researcher and fully deserved of being professor. And here's your gift. <laughs>